today we're going to have a, a short interview with Michael Woods, Dr. Michael Woods from the Asian Turfgrass Institute, and he's going to present some of the information and observations that he's collected over the years of working in the United States and also in Asia, and uh, some of his uh, research when he was at Cornell working with uh, Dr. Frank Rossi on potassium. So, Michael, why don't you uh, give us a little bit of your background, and then we'll uh, get into the uh, into the slides that you uh, sent over and we'll uh, see what we come up with. Well thank you Larry. I'm in Bangkok this morning and it's a pleasure to be talking with you about this. I'm originally from Oregon and after I finished my undergraduate studies at Oregon State University I went to China and became a golf course superintendent uh, at a Nicholas design course called Shanghai Lynx. So it's again it's a challenging environment and it, we were growing in sand root zones and I was really really interested in how can we optimize turf grass performance through applying just the right nutrients especially during the time of stress so I was thinking well potassium clearly is playing some role in this so that just led into what I was doing at Cornell because I was so I was so interested in that and this is when I went to Cornell, we started a project. This is on a, a research screen. This is a plot of L93. And we applied different rates of potassium fertilizer and then measured through various soil testing techniques what the availability of the potassium was to the plant. And we also measured the turf grass performance and the ball roll speed and the root depth and the chlorophyll content and very, various other performance characteristics of the grass trying to see what effect we could measure from the potassium fertilizer applications what what effect the potassium was having on the grass and this is is this the same plot or this is this is a this is the same the same plot this is l93 creeping bent grass uh, maintained as a putting green at uh, at cornell in ithaca new york and in those plots we applied potassium over the, the course of this two-year study at different rates. So some of these plots got no potassium for two years. Some of them got 75 grams of potassium per square meter, which is 15 pounds of potassium per thousand square feet per year. And there, there was a range of rates that we applied, and, and we ended up with nitrogen to potassium ratios that went anywhere from one to zero up to one to five. So in some of the plots, there was no potassium applied. In some of the plots, there was five times as much potassium applied as there was nitrogen. So that and I would have, I, and Larry, I would have expected with this wide range of rates, I would have expected to see some response, and we just saw nothing. So you know, that's visual response, though. So we're not, we're, we're just, we're still talking. Um, appearance and performance of the turf as well, you see it. So you're not talking about there, uh, any diseases yet or, or other factors. Well, Larry, you know that the disease response we saw, I evaluated it for dollar spot. When dollar spot came in, we didn't apply preventative fungicides on this plot to see what diseases could come in. With dollar spot, there was nothing. With snow mold, um, you're aware that we saw actually increased disease when we put more potassium. Um, we measured root depth, or no, we measured root biomass a couple of times, saw no response. We measured leaf chlorophyll content, no response. And it, I'm a, a former golf course superintendent, and I was out on those plots every day looking at the turf grass performance and really evaluating how how is this grass? Is this a good turf grass surface or not? And putting more potassium didn't have a didn't have any effect and I was shocked that for two years we could apply no potassium and have turf just as good as when we did apply potassium and the reason is it's not that potassium isn't important the reason why that is is because there was already enough potassium being supplied by the the sand in in this case to to meet the requirements of the plant and that led into another experiment where we could uh, induce potassium deficiency and I did that by collecting sands from all around the world. I, I went to 
to Europe on holiday and collected some sands from golf course putting green. So these are just like soil samples that you might collect from a golf course putting green. I collected those, brought them back to Cornell from Europe, from um, from all around Asia, from different places in the United States. Um, I, I disremember exactly where they all came from, but some people sent me some some samples from Hawaii, etc. So we had we had sands ranging in pH from 4.5 to 8.5 with different levels of, of potassium availability and if we grew then in the greenhouse you can see the plot that's the second from the or the the grass second from right that's in a sand with no potassium and the, the seeds germinate and then they die because they don't have enough potassium to grow in the greenhouse we supplied nitrogen and phosphorus and then just let the sands however much potassium was in the sands supply the potassium to the to the grass and in this way we can determine how there would be a growth response based on the potassium supply for these 45 sands then we use the malik 3 soil testing extractant to evaluate the potassium availability and we see that on the x-axis going from basically zero uh, no potassium availability all up, all the way up to almost 200 parts per million potassium and we measured how much the grass grew in those pots so we were growing a1 creeping bent grass and basically you can see that if you're less than 50 parts per million less than 50 milligrams per kilogram potassium the there's a likelihood that you won't get maximum growth rate once we get up to more than 50 parts per million potassium in the soil as measured by the malik 3 soil testing extractant there's a plateau and then we get maximum growth rate so we see that the we would go up and then and then across with the if we would draw a line through those um, right. points yeah that's pretty clear sort of a growth response um, with that range of potassium levels all right so you're saying that uh, and you're, you're saying at 50 parts per million that's where your target is uh, you're, you're, you're less than sufficiency here you're starting to see the growth fall off as you get below 50 parts per million. Right. I, I don't look at like at because from all of my experience adding and research adding more doesn't give us a benefit. If we get deficient then we then we can have a problem but once we correct that deficiency then then potassium is not the problem anymore. Something else would be the problem if, if turf grass isn't performing well. So I like to maintain soil potassium, and keep in mind this is all in sand-based root zones. Um, in sand-based root zones, I like to main, maintain potassium at 50 parts per million or, or slightly above. And we can do that actually by modifying the nitrogen to potassium ratio. In my research, I found that if we apply nitrogen and potassium in a two to one ratio, two parts nitrogen, one part potassium, we tend to maintain a stable level of potassium in the soil. And the reason for that is, uh, is pretty simple, really. If you look at what's in the turf grass leaves, what's harvested, and let's use, let's use creeping bent grass as a, as a typical plant, we'll usually have about 4% nitrogen in the leaves. We usually have about 2% potassium in the leaves. What's in the leaves is a 2 to 1 ratio of nitrogen and potassium. And if we supply that as fertilizer, that just supplies what the plants need, the, and and that maintains the same level of potassium in the soil. Yeah, I, I, I don't really have a problem with that idea. We we set our levels about double what what you're recommending. Uh, we set them up at about 110 parts per million. We're looking at some other factors also, but um, other than the detriment you saw with the snow mold we're sort of like well why don't we just be careful and put a little bit more in and that's where our averages are uh, falling out is around 110 parts per million on good performing greens as assessed by the superintendent was, yeah if what i would do to to make it really simple is if i was less than 50 parts per million potassium in the soil i would make a couple of supplemental applications of potassium to increase the level to more than 50 parts per million and we can do that basically um, one pound of potassium per thousand square feet or five grams of potassium per square meter will increase the soil levels by about 30 parts per million and 
So I look at, at, at that as a way to gauge how much potassium we would need to apply to increase the, the soil a certain amount. One, if I was at 50 to 70 parts per million in the soil, I would put potassium and nitrogen out at a one-to-one -one ratio, one part nitrogen, one part potassium. And over time, that's gonna increase the potassium availability in the soil because we're putting out more potassium than the plant can use. So that extra potassium is going to be held on some of the cation exchange sites in the soil. If we're more than 70 parts per million, so now we've got 20, million, uh, 20 parts per million above what I think the, crit the critical level may be, I go back to applying two parts nitrogen, one part potassium, and that's just going to maintain us at that, at that level of relatively high potassium availability in the soil. Well, that sounds perfect. Um, let me just put your last shot of your, uh, your plots at the Asian uh, Turfgrass Center up. I believe these are your... Yeah, here, this, this is in Thailand, this picture we took in 2008. And there I grew seashore paspalum and Bermuda and zoysia and carpet grass and uh, blue cooch and various, various types of warm season grasses in both soil and in sand. And we had relatively high sodium levels in the soil here, relatively low potassium levels. I made uh, various experiments where we've applied different rates of potassium with and without nitrogen, with and without calcium to seashore paspalum to zoysia to bermuda grass and again we haven't seen any response with uh, visual turf grass appearance we haven't seen any response with biomass production and we haven't seen any response with diseases that that came in specifically with dollar spot and that leads me to believe that it's kind of universal that the amount of potassium that gets used on, on golf course turf is more than the plants require and more than, than is necessary. Yeah, well, I, I guess I'm not going to disagree with you at this point. There's, uh, there's the rapid light. I have to just check out on the rapid light thing and just make sure we're, <laughs> we're not having a problem with potassium and sodium. And, um, and then Bruce Clark was just... Uh, talking about um, anthracnose and, and potassium in a, in a recent meeting, but I'm not sure that we have all the data on the, um, on the levels in the soil or the plant levels, but uh, I think um, it, it'll be interesting to figure out how the potassium situation turns out and whether or not uh, we're, we're talking similar ideas or, or if uh, there's going to be some complaints, but I think you got pretty solid basis for uh, those potassium recommendations and we've been using them a little bit recently and I think it's going to probably work out pretty well. Well cool Larry, thank you very much and I hope that that through this video and maybe we can have some follow-up discussion with golf course superintendents or with other scientists or researchers and uh, I'm I would suspect that some people might disagree with this because they always get a good response by putting extra potassium but uh, if people are interested in this, I'd be happy to talk more about cation exchange capacity, how much potassium is held in the soil, what leaching really means, um, how that reduces potassium or not. Because just as a, as a, as a quick thing to say, if, if potassium is held on a, a cation exchange site, we don't really leach it. The cation exchange capacity doesn't change by leaching. Right. So if your potassium levels go down, when when you have a heavy rainfall or leaching, that potassium wasn't uh, on an exchange site anyway. It was uh, in soil solution. And that means maybe you had a salt problem, not that you had a high level of potassium availability. We hope you enjoyed this interview with Dr. Micah Woods from the Asian Turfgrass Center discussing potassium. Interviews with the experts is brought to you by Pace Turf.